Um, I'm very grateful to be invited. Thank you so much, Evelyn and uh, Vanessa. Thank you for um, chairing the session. Uh, I think Monk School, so it has such a great reputation already for the way in which it seeks to, um, and over here too, over in the States, to demystify uh, manuscript studies and to make it a field that is more accessible to all, which I think is uh, incredibly important. I think it's ha ha has been pale paleography, codicology, and manuscript studies broadly. It has been, and um, in some respects still is, uh, in these, it seems, an esoteric area of research. It is often very hierarchical. Uh, it suffers, I think, from uh, elitism that comes through in terms of the languages that you work on, the manuscripts and the regions that you study. And I think that that hinders the um, accessibility of the field. And I think it can prevent people from feeling welcome in the field. And that is, uh, to my mind, really problematic, particularly in this day and age. And it's especially important given the millions of images, sadly not at the British Library at the moment, but generally the, the millions of images that we can access um, as scholars or as interested and engaged members of the public. As this information becomes more and more uh, prolific and as tools for exploring it with speed become more uh, easily um, available to us, I think it's even more critical that we have trained or at least very sort of uh, alert um, students and scholars working on this material. I talked to my own students about ChatGPT and also tools like Transcribus, and it's fine for them to use these kinds of tools, but if they're not actually able to identify mistakes, then what they are kind of producing uh, may not be up to scratch at all. And um, identifying mistakes can only be done by people who are trained, either in the languages or in the paleography itself. So now is the time to be doing this kind of work. And so I'm really happy that you're doing it there. And um, I know there's lots of other institutions are doing material materials like this to open up manuscript studies to a broader audience. All right. So that's my kind of I don't know what that is. That's my my bandstand uh, set of comments for the for the time being. And so I'll just I'll share I will we'll try and share my screen with you. All right, hopefully you can see that. I now can't see myself, which is it's not a bad thing, but um, so I'm going to use some examples in uh, this discussion um, uh, with this fabulous title about the human, which um, thank you, Evelyn, for the title, The Human Experience is an Integral Part of the History and Identity of the Book. I'm going to use some examples that I talked about in my book, The Perceptions of Medieval Manuscripts, but I'm also going to use other examples. And the majority of my examples are drawn from uh, British manuscripts datable to probably, I don't know, like 1100 to maybe 1300. That's not really the point. The point is that you can take any of the things that I'm saying and you can apply them to any case studies that you like. And it can be diplomata as well as, co as codices, right? So it can be, and, and fragments, in fact. So it can be any handwritten material and it can be any handwritten material of any period. So I think that's that's probably true. And it seems to me, um, and especially, you know, when I see um, this kind of synopsis of the talk that's in this kind of current title, it seems to me obvious. So maybe all I'm telling you is something that is completely obvious already. And if that's the case, well, that's fine, right? That's fine. Um, what it What it is, what it boils down to really, and this is, um, this is where I would give an alternative title now that I'm, I'm uh, here in front of you. And that would be um, an introduction to the phenomenology of the book. And that is what my Oxford book was about. But I but it's also a broader kind of conceptualization of the way that we can work with manuscript materials. And the phenomenological, um, as opposed to something like code ecology or even paleography or textual studies or art historical approaches, the phenomenological insists on the kind of gestalt. It insists on the wholeness of the textual object in front of you and of the validity um, of approaching these, these works, these texts, these textual objects through the idea of the holistic um, or wholeness. So definition of phenomenology in this case, and I, I follow the work of um, uh, principally Maurice Merleau-Ponty, but there are um, obviously other phenomenologists. Um, phenomenology is, the and he says, the lived existence um, 
lived existence in the world. And so in our case, then, it's the lived existence of the textual object in the world. Uh, that is the biography of the textual object, the book, the manuscript, uh, the diploma, um, its biography through time and space and, and critically encounter. So this is these, you know, this is a, an approach that thinks about encounters that the book has. Um, its books is part of a system of, um, I suppose, the human record. Uh, and Merleau-Ponty talks about objects, seeing all other objects. In other words, books and uh, charters, uh, any textual object fragments exist in a sort of system. So there's a structural systematicity um, of book history uh, or the history of text technologies in a in a bigger a bigger world of the uh, written record. And um, critical, of course, to the existence of the textual object is the human interaction with the book. And this is um, as completely obvious as that fantastic uh, YouTube video that was posted in about 2007. So it was 16 years old, it was Danish, I think, in origin. It was a comedy skit about the fact that monks couldn't work out how to open a codex. But the, if the book, in a sense, the textual object doesn't function without a human encounter. And, and in fact, it can't be created right without a human encounter. So the idea of human interaction with the book um, is, is uh, the object's ideators, producers, immediate users, but also um, interactors with the book as historical kind of conversationists, as, as owners, from individuals and private owners to book dealers and institutional repositories. So there's all of that, and I think that that um, is, with a ter material turn in manuscript studies, is, is perhaps more of the way that we, we study now anyway. But also what I want to kind of really think about, and my most recent publications, um, I'm just thinking of them, I think my, mo my most recent publications, so a couple of, three articles this year, um, deal really with the humanity of the people who uh, interact with books and who created books. The humanity of these people in the sense of the everydayness of so many books and documents. And what I'm showing you right here, London Lambeth Palace, Lambeth uh, 107, is obviously it's a, you know, it's a fairly deluxe volume in the sense that um, it's got this, uh, the preceding um, image was of this too. It's got this um, beautiful illustration. It's you know, uh, chromatic, it's many colours, got chromatic. So this is a very fine um, product, an expensive product. But there, um, but there's a lot of humanists involved in this book and a, and a significant amount of everyday humanity witnessable in these early textual materials. And if we think about these textual materials in a more everyday sense, um, conscious of the fact that so few people were literate and even fewer people could write, if we still think about these books away from the more deluxe categories, then we are allowing for flawed productions of the individual. We move away from scholarly hierarchies of perfection that fail to account for the majority of textual objects that were produced in this uh, period. And we recognise the unreality of many of our received pedagogic categories. So it's a, just a sort of very different way of thinking. So ph phenomenologically then, all objects, all things have meaning. They're comprised of the reality, that's the visible, plus the intentionality of the perceiver, that's the invisible, and how the perceiver responds to or conceives of the object. Um, and there's evidence to show how some medieval producers and users of text, uh, um, of manuscripts, um, conceived of the book's depiction and function, functionality, but we can also trace delight and joy from scribal performance and occasional notes or stories um, of scribal endeavours or the um, perceptions of those who came across this material. Um, and images, of course, of books in medieval manuscripts and other artistic performances are key to understanding the form and function of the book in the Middle Ages. And so an image like this, for example. So London Lambeth Palace, uh, Manuscript 107 is a later 12th century manuscript from Bildwas in Shropshire, and it contains Hugh Folliot's writings. And at Folio 84 Verso, which is this, and this is digitised um, and it's online at the uh, Lambeth Palace Digital Library. Um, Folio 84 Verso shows us this detailed and elaborate image written and drawn in red and green, 
and shows the depiction of four stages of a monk's career. So that was the preceding image. Uh, the abbot in the preceding image sat at the top of the wheel. And here in this image, which I want to focus on, is a monk benignly copying an open, ruled and bound manuscript of the Psalms. And the legend uh, is uh, Hick uh, said it in paupertate sicut cum hilaritate. So here he sits in poverty as with cheerfulness. Um, and the monk is holding a small red feathered quill and a knife and he makes his way through Psalm 1 in these opening words in red. And of course, the mini book, this little book on his lectern, exactly replicates the larger book with the green ruling and the red writing on this folio. Um, and the opening words of Psalm 1, they are to sphere quon non abiet in concilio impiorum et in via pacatorum non stetit. So it's, um, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful kind of microcosmic um, sort of example of the, of the book as a whole. But the scribe has completed both verso and recto of the miniature single column book with green ruling and writing. And it has this tabbed end band. Codicologically, it has a tabbed end band, single columns. And you can see from the book that, in a sense, the book is already written. Well, it is already written because it's the Psalms. Um, historically, uh, but it's also it's an already complete and whole book uh, that he is writing. And these uh, images unequivocally demonstrate two things, and that is the sanctity of the medieval manuscript. Um, and often the scroll is depicted in this way, too. And the wholeness of the book, that is to say, the book is conceived of and represented as a whole bound manuscript, not a book in its various constituent parts. The book is imminent in the phenomenological sense, that is, it's an object to be discerned in its entirety at all points in its long biography, despite the necessary acknowledgement that we can only ever actually apprehend books or any other objects transcendentally, that is, perspectively, um, partially. And this is particularly true, of course, of the digital aspect of books. So that's a long, that's a long winded kind of uh, underscored explanation of the ways in which we can think of books holistically by looking at these miniature books in books, but also then um, thinking about the, uh, com the, not the completeness, the wholeness, those things are different, the wholeness um, of the textual object as we work on it. And so in a sense, you can take this in uh, very many different directions and it does involve sometimes some discomfort because, you know, I'm not an art historian, but I've just described this image to you. Um, you may not be, um, I don't know, a Latinist, but you're going to have to work with the text of the book. And I think, um, you know, we can be forgiving of each other as we um, try to make our way through these books in this um, interdisciplinary and holistic way. So this is um, Herbert of Bosham um, and his uh, production of Lombard's Magna Glossatura on the Psalms. Um, and this is a multi-part volume. And also there are other volumes by Herbert of Bosham, who was um, one of Thomas Beckett's coterie of prelates. So Herbert of Bosham was a, was a pupil of um, Beckett and accompanied him to Pontigny um, during the exile of uh, Beckett. Uh, and so this production, it's a, it's a really, it's a stunning, um, stunning book. And we'll have a look at some of the larger folios in, in just a moment. But what's quite interesting here and coming back to this sort of study of these little images where there is a textual object um, held up and thinking about the human encounter with the book. You know, you have this doubling of the human encounter. We're looking at this image and this image shows Beckett looking at um, the book that Bosham, the little figure, is holding up to him. And above the um, image, you can just make out the word pontifex, I think, just, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but it's in between the two male figures, the word pontifex. So it looks like we have something in that um, sanctus, um, it was St. Thomas, right, St. Thomas here, something et pontifex, um, and that's, it's been abraded there at the top. Um, and so, uh, this is a sort of demonstration of the significance of Bosham's relationship with Beckett. And Bosham tells us as he goes about the um, production of the Psalms and the epistles 
that these were two works that were precious to Thomas, who thought that the we can read these materials specifically these um, books, um, the epistles and the psalms as two with as two spiritual eyes that they represent two spiritual eyes. The psalms for Beckett represent the mystical eyes of the Christian, and the epistles represent the moral eyes. And so that um, underpins this work that um, Bosham presents to us in these elaborate and very beautiful deluxe volumes. He tells us that um, that he took up this work uh, in order, and he tells us exactly how he goes about this work um, and even how he compiles the manuscript itself, distinguishing words among the commentators and even from the words of the glossator. And he's telling the reader, um, I don't want you to mistake Cassiodorus for Augustine or Jerome or the glossator for the expositor, um, uh, in which sometimes even more learned readers have, have erred or been mistaken. We've added certain notes about the commentators. So it's a very sort of, as you would expect, self-conscious um, production. And he tells us in the preface to the works how he goes about it. And every detail, and he himself does this work, by the way, he is the um, producer of this volume. In that little book that he holds up, uh, one commentator thinks that it might be a scroll, but it's not a scroll because it's rigid, right? So it's either a tablet um, or it's a, a, a completed book that is being shown in this um, single um, aspect. Um, it's got, uh, I think it's Doce Illum is written on the left-hand side, as you can see it there. And that appears to be a reference to Augustine, um, who uh, talks about, uh, blessed is the man who you, who you instruct, Lord, and teach him from your law. And so Herbert of Bosham on the right there is actually directly conversing with Beckett on the left. And these books were produced probably just after um, Beckett's uh, martyrdom, as you can tell from the introduction to the preface in the red um, on the right hand side. This is what a pair of folios looks like in this manuscript. Um, in, it's very complex. Um, the manuscript has suffered uh, damage from people cutting out the um, initials that contain the figures, the Augustines and the Cassiodoruses and the Jeromes that are drawn in the margins as the sources for the glosses and the, and the um, uh, instruction through the volume. And you can see from, from the layout, it's very complex. Um, there's an, an awful lot of planning and work that's got into this. It is a deluxe volume, as I say. What we can tell from this, though, is the joy of the production um, as far as Herbert of Bosham is concerned. The little animals and the interlace and the figures themselves. They're, this, to my mind, this volume and a number of others produced in Canterbury at this time really speak to the delight and the joy of the written word. And that is something that is um, understood in terms of, the, of, the, of religious writings produced in this whole long, long, long medieval period. But it's often difficult to trace. Uh, in volumes like this, it becomes uh, much more straightforward to understand the human impulse behind the creation of the volume. And I think it's perfectly fine to talk in these ways about these books. And in fact, we should be thinking in these terms, this human encounter with the written word and what it means to transmit it. So in, ter in terms of the transmission of the book and the encounters with the book, um, and this may be a glaringly um, obvious slide. I just sort of started listing, um, I did, I started listing the humans that we find in the book. Um, we don't know who they are for the greatest majority of the time. And even when we have names, we can't trace who those, who those names belong to. But we have all of these colleagues, if you like, kind of producing this work for us, the ideators, um, that's before the book is even produced, the compilers, the scribes, rubricators, miniators, the illuminators, artists, correctors, readers, researchers, that's the, in the 14th century. Um, that's the tremulous hand of Worcester, if you've heard of him or her, the scribe who's uh, wobbly writing annotates so many uh, medieval books, particularly written in English and Latin, at possibly at Worcester, in the Worcester region, in the uh, late 12th, early 13th century. 
that person was a researcher. You can tell by the kinds of interactions they had with the book that that was their sort of function. Uh, these annotators and expanders, the browsers, the amalgamators, the owners, the multiple owners that provide us with provenance, the passers-by, the people who left something in the book or who um, produced a trace, something that we would call a scribble um, or a doodle. Both of those terms are problematic um, in English because they're uh, pejorative. Uh, the scholars, that's I suppose us, the dealers, the bibliophiles and the biblioclasts. And none of that kind of really involves the people who produce the materials and the tools themselves. There's a whole kind of other tranche of people. So it's really interesting when you start to, this was, I did this, you know, this is very kind of a very quick thing and we can add to it or in fact kind of argue about some of the terminology. But when you think about the humans in the book, um, and again, it seems very um, obvious to me, but nevertheless worth saying. I mean, it's an extraordinary kind of entourage of people who accompany the books, um, even kind of conceptually or abstractly uh, as we think about them. And that that makes any book, any, and this is quite, a, it's, a, it's not an everyday book, but it's certainly not the deluxe material that we've been looking at so far. Um, it it uh, asks us to engage in different kinds of questions when we encounter something like this. This is a really interesting uh, book associated with Elizabeth of York, that is the wife of Henry the Seventh, the mother of Henry the Eighth, and um, I. It's my favourite book in our our entire collection, um, and it it's I find it touching. It's a very moving book. Uh, it has a legend associated with it that Elizabeth of York had this book with her. In fact, when she died in childbirth, um, it's a book that was. Uh, obviously not produced for her. Uh, it's a book dated to about 1200, 1210. It's likely to come from Westminster Abbey. And the way that she, Elizabeth of York, might have probably ended up with it is because it was given to her by her mother, Elizabeth Woodville, who may have been given the book by Westminster monks while she was in sanctuary there in the late 15th century. And that passing down of books, that bequeathing of books, uh, it's obviously an important part of the way in which we can understand the reception of books and the value placed on books. And there's much that we can say about just this opening, the slight tremble in the um, in the hand in the Gothic. I suppose it's, it's, it's aiming at a quadrata, the Gothic quadrata. So uh, we use this, these terms. There's a lot that we can say and use for dating um, in this hand. And um, it's adorning and, and it, the size of the script for the size of the book, but the book has been trimmed, trimmed in the 19th century. So we can begin to think about who's in this book, both in terms of the text, but also in terms of all the figures kind of associated with it. Um, I'm not sure that we would think of this script in traditional terms uh, as a fine example of the, of the hand. Textura Libraria, we might think of it, but the sort of wobbliness and its uh, irregularity would bring out the hierarchical judgment-based, uh, value judgment-based responses, I think, by paleographers. And I have um, written a lot about this and I have a problem with it and I'm happy to come back and talk about this one. But I just want to look at a few other examples of the ways in which we begin to critique the humans who produced the book. Um, thinking about them in terms that are post-Kantian, that are aesthetically compelled, calligraphically compelled in ways that are, are not appropriate for the material that we study. Um, this is a manuscript I actually did my, my postgraduate, my postdoctoral, not postdoctoral, my doctoral work on Cambridge Corpus Christi College 303, mid-12th century, probably Rochester, three main scribes, two who do long stints, one who does a much shorter stint. And to look at this, um, it is a very good example of uh, a late English vernacular mini school showing features that we would label as proto-Gothic um, or late Caroline mini school. Uh, the scribe is, you know, really consistent, looks like a, an expert scribe. And you can see, if you look really closely, errors on the page that have been very beautifully uh, 
noted but not made uh, too explicit to spoil the overall aesthetic of the page. Of course, I'm talking about the left hand, uh, the, the verso, uh, verso, the left hand side of what you can see, lines three, four, five, and then just slightly further down, where we see the scribe whose uh, attention had wandered and they had begun to uh, write out the same things twice. But it's actually, it's uh, dittographic, but they, here, the first half of it is um, haplographic and the second half of it is dittographic. So there's two different kinds of homoeia to Luton, as we call it, just scribal error. There's two kinds of scribal error here. And then further down, a different method, uh, subpuncting, uh, showing us that this at foreign him uh, is, is another error and needs to come out. Now, when we think about errors like this, uh, it's easy to dismiss the work of scribes who are who have persistent errors as poor scribes, mechanistic scribes, um, non-attentive scribes, scribes who didn't understand what they were copying. All these kinds of judgments, value judgments, are assigned to the work of scribes who make a sustained errors like this. Um, that does that doesn't allow, I think, for the flawedness of all humans in the in the production of um, of work, and to be more sympathetic to the types of errors that they produce, and to think more uh, profoundly, more in depth about the errors that they produce, I think leads to some quite um, interesting and less value judgment laden uh, conclusions or consequences. What's particularly interesting uh, in this case is that the um, correction in the red line is done by the rubricator in the manuscript. So this scribe who writes the least amount of text, in fact, just a handful of folios, um, is known as scribe C. And this scribe is also the person who goes through the entire manuscript, miniating the red initials, and rubricating intertextually the um, titles for the saints' lives and sermons in the book. Now, Neil Ripley Kerr, who uh, wrote the catalogue of manuscripts containing Anglo-Saxon, which I am doing a second edition of with uh, Stuart Brooks, Kerr describes this hand, this one that you're looking at here, who does the correction and the miniation and the rubrication as the less good hand. But actually, the activities of this scribe through the manuscript show that this scribe was the senior scribe, not a junior scribe in training or something like that, that the phrase the less good hand seems to imply. So that's um, that's kind of interesting set of realities in relation to the labels that we use or the way in which we would derogate particular scribes work, the mechanistic scribe who makes mistakes or the scribe whose writing is less regular, um, less uh, calligraphically pleasing, who we would label as the less good hand. Both of those things are not appropriate ways to think about the work of these um, labourers, these scribes, as they produce these texts. It is the fact, of course, that the less good hand too, um, irregular hands, poor hands, clumsy hands, over large hands, um, all of the labels that you'll find in major paleographical handbooks right up to the present day, all of those labels just do not, in a sense, do justice to um, scribes in this entire long kind of medieval period. And in fact, much later than that, into the early modern period, and perhaps even as far as the 19th century. Scribes that we would regard as poor, uh, poor quality, scratchy, um, hurried, all of those kinds of terms that suggest a lack of care or a lack of training. Those terms uh, uh, just don't map onto the producers. So this is very likely to be the hand of St. Hugh of Lincoln. And, you know, other figures that we know about, let's say, Wolfstan, Archbishop of York, uh, who died in 1023, he also had what would be considered a like a poor hand, not a well-trained hand, but he was the leading statesman of his day. 
and a theologian and a writer and a you know conciliar and all the rest of it so I think we need to look again at the labels that we use and be much more conscious in our derogation of the efforts and endeavours of scribes and indeed the functionality of the work that they're producing. So this would be true also of a scribe that I see, I just I feel like I've just talked about forever. It's not actually true. But um, the more I work on the scribes in this manuscript, uh, the more there is to say. So this Oxford Bodleian Library, Bodley 343, is written in about um, certainly the majority of the text that you can see in front of you. It's Latin and it's English. Uh, it's written in about 1170, 1180. But what I'm interested in is the text. So the right hand image and the text at the bottom right of the right hand image, which is a poem some of you may know. It's a very short poem. It's called The Grave. And it was um, added to the space at the bottom of the folio, which is um, 170 recto, the last recto in the uh, um, the last text filled recto in the kind of original production of the of the manuscript. So when this manuscript was when this scribe added this poem to the bottom of the page, it was the last thing in the book, and it's you know it's about death. Uh, and here it is in um, close up. This is not a hand that you would describe complementarily. This is a hand that you would use all the terms, uh, the kind of slightly derogatory value, late value judgment laden terms that I've suggested. And the scribe makes mistakes, that two of which I've ringed. There's another one on the first line um, on the left hand side. Um, and these mistakes are uh, just again kind of um, I skip, I skip mistakes, which suggests for some that, you know, the scribe wasn't concentrating. What's interesting is they've been erased after um, after the poem was completed. So somebody came back and corrected this because those mistakes were not written over. That um, I only realized, I just I don't know why that just suddenly kind of occurred to me as I was looking at that slide uh, yesterday. I've talked about the mistakes, but not not in that those terms. And you can see at the bottom of the poem, there's another line and a half of writing in an even less good hand, if you want to use those words. But actually, again, in that scribe appears elsewhere in the manuscript. These terms are just not appropriate, especially when you consider trying to write at the very, very bottom, at the very edge of the bottom of a folio. It's, in, it's really incredibly difficult to do, especially if you're writing on a, an angled lectern and you've got the quill between your, um, you've got the quill between your two fingers like this and your and your wrist as you write at this angle is, is not supported by it. It's a, it's a free floating wrist. And to talk about these scribes um, as poor or, or untrained, just, I mean, it's so inappropriate given that, given what you had to go through to be trained uh, in this period, to be able to write at all, to be able to cut a quill, to be able to make your ink or at least access your ink, to be able to access these materials. This is not like picking up a, a pencil and a notebook you know, all of which we have kind of lying around on our desks. This is not like that. And so the terms that we use um, are hyperliterate kind of post print terms to describe cultures that just are not are not operating in that same way. The implications of this kind of derogation are very, very serious and um, affect who is visible in this world of manuscript studies and who is not. It affects who we study and who we don't. The idea of the kind of everyday, as uh, John Wilcox once said, of Junius 80, uh, Oxford Bodleian Library manuscripts, Junius 85 and 86, he talked about those books as scruffy little books. The implications of that is somehow uh, that they're not really worth our while, or at least that is one implication of that kind of judgment, that they're not really worth our while. And so we tend to not pay the attention that we might to things that are described as scribbles and doodles. I mean, that is a critical, that's an error. That's a critical error. And this holistic phenomenological response to books insists that we kind of look at all of the things that we can to make more visible the full encounter of the book with all of its humans, if you like. Um, it brings us to the this... Uh, a really important subject of women's writing. Women so far in the record 
reading the work of Alison Beach and uh, Diane Watt and many of the others who've written about women scribes, both in Germany and Europe more broadly in the Western tradition. What happens is these women become, uh, the women scribes are invisible. They seem to form about 1% of the producers of uh, manuscripts in this period, which I actually don't believe. But how do we find women scribes? How do we find women producers of books? Um, this is a women, woman scribe of the Beowulf manuscript on the right hand side here, um, Cheryl Jacobson, who's from Iowa. Uh, and she's done this uh, full replication of the Beowulf manuscript using matched hands throughout. So one of the ways to think about rethink, rethink how we work with these materials is to use uh, something like this. This is a mortuary roll that is a book of condolences, if you like, from uh, almost uh, 400 um, religious institutions. There are mortuary rolls all over Europe in the um, Middle Ages and in the High Middle Ages. Very few of them survive in Britain, but I think many more survive on the continent. And um, a recent project we've been, uh, Mateusz Wafinski, who's at Erfurt, and I have been working on two scrolls from probably around the sort of 10, 20, uh, the, sorry, the 1220s and the 12, uh, 1210s and 1220s. Um, and this is one of them, Cambridge, uh, St. John's College, manuscript N31. It's 36 feet long, so it's very difficult to kind of apprehend it. In fact, we I, I laid it out to about 12 feet. No, that's too much, 10 feet at a time. But it's very difficult to kind of apprehend it in its, in its fullness. What's very interesting when you see it in reality as opposed to in any sort of digital images is that there are actually um, condolence entries from monastic inst monastic and uh, conventual institutions on the back as well as on the um, front of the scroll as it un unfurls. And this is for Amphilisa, um, who's the prioress, who was the prioress of Lille Church, who died between 1208 and 12 1221, and probably earlier in this period rather than later. So this might be around 1215, 1220, something like that. Very sort of precise uh, paleographical uh, material to be working with. And we have created an interactive map, which is available on GitHub, Medieval Networks of Memory, where you can click on any of the bobbles on the left-hand side there, any of the circles, and it takes you into uh, the institution and it shows you the titulus and it shows you the transcription of the entry or titulus and it shows you what type of institution it was whether it's male and female. And we have a working hypothesis and we are working with this hypothesis that unless we can see it's not the case, we are going to assume in the first instance that the entries from the female institutions may very well be written by women scribes. That's our, that's our working hypothesis. And it's turning up some quite interesting finds. Um, and so here, here are some examples of uh, hands, there's the holy well hand uh, in the middle there where you can see it takes you to a kind of largish hand that is um, slightly irregular. It's emulating or it's, it's working towards a gothic book hand, a textura hand, maybe a rotunda. Um, and then you can see also the incredible variety of different forms of both script and hand um, on this particular membrane, and that is typical of all of the membranes, which 40, 46 membranes um, through the scroll as a whole. And this is what you see on mortuary scrolls. And Neil Kerr in English manuscripts after the, in the century after the conquest talks about these mortuary rolls as being the most incredible resource for paleographers, because what they show is that while we can, um, sorry, that's slightly fuzzy, while we can use our labels to describe the model script to which the scribe might be um, heading. But the manifestation through the hand is something usually that is neither one thing nor the other. Mateusz and I have labeled that blended hands, blended hands being um, obviously combinations of different scripts manifested in the stint of the scribe. And even in the same sort of institution, 
within a 10 year period, two very different scrolls, two very different scribes. This is St. Sepulchre's, a Benedictine nunnery in Canterbury, uh, writing pr pretty much the same uh, message of condolence, but to two different prioresses, to Amphilisa on the top in that uh, rather old fashioned hand that suggests somebody's been trained, but perhaps not trained to write as a professional scribe, to a more uh, calligraphic, using cal a calligraphic axis of description, a more calligraphic um, and up to date hand in the uh, Edgerton role, which is the one at the bottom, which is for Lucy Prioress um, of Headingham which was written perhaps a decade later. And there are features that really, you know, that you can really uh, see there that make this um, a later text. Even these uh, pair, this pair of scribal efforts can tell us about the bookishness of the nunnery, the way that they understand uh, writing, the way that they understand writing to be produced, uh, the way that the scribe might have been trained. And if we are right in our working hypothesis that women could have written some of these entries, then um, these may be women's hands. And the way that we go on to describe them um, it becomes critically important to be sure that we don't use derogatory and pejorative terminology when that simply um, is inapplicable to the, this work at this time. So this work builds on Jean Dufour's uh, incredible work that was uh, all of the mortuary rolls uh, throughout, I think, um, certainly France and Britain um, and possibly uh, more broadly too. It's volume two that we have worked with um, and uh, we're very grateful for um, all of his research. And it allows us um, to kind of uh, investigate these scrolls at very great detail now that we have transcribed ourselves all of the entries We've um, got a, a significant database. We're able to extrapolate individual features as well as features of the entries more broadly to um, visualize what this handwriting could tell us, both in terms of region, uh, date, uh, possible points of origin um, of, of the scribal features. Uh, it's a, it's a, a project with, uh, it's, a, it's a digital and uh, typical kind of written project um, with, with a great deal of promise, I think, for providing a more realistic paleographical overview of uh, production of manuscripts uh, and script at this at this point. So lots of uh, images just to kind of um, make my make my points, including some handwriting that uh, Paleographers would not normally comment on in any great detail, like the Romsey scribe here. And my favourite, which is the Roxall scribe, um, all nunneries, so possibly um, written by women. That allows us access to other kinds of material, like uh, diplomata, because the roles are themselves diplomata. It takes us into um, the realms of diplomata and to considering other ways in which women like Ella, the um, abbess of Laycock, uh, and this is her profession of obedience to the Bishop of Salisbury, how those women accessed literacy and what their understanding of literacy might have been. Um, I'm actually going to leave it there. I've got more slides I could show you, but um, I think I would be making the same points just using different images. So I'm actually going to leave it there. So we do have some time uh, for question and answers. And